want to uh, thank the Bang Bang Con uh, committee for letting me do this talk. Uh, it was originally scheduled for last year, but uh, last year at this time I was uh, in bed with a two-week migraine, so today is uh, vastly better. <laughs> um, so I want to start out with uh, saying, well, this isn't an econ conference, so why am I talking about uh, programmers and economists? Well, economists do a ton of programming. Um, from the first class uh, to, uh, to, to dissertation work to uh, current research, you're you know, doing a lot of programming as an economist. And uh, the programs often have serious policy implications because fairly frequently you're generating statistical models, those results get published in papers, or they're part of uh, policy analyses, and all so sorts of important decisions are made based on uh, the output of these programs. And I find that tech and econ cultures have a lot of similarities, and I'll get to that in a bit. Uh, finally, some parts of the uh, economics philosophy have changed my views on programming and vice versa. Uh, a little bit about me. I was at Carnegie Mellon for two years, studied CS, but I can only remember about 10% of it on a good day, and I, I left for reasons. <laughs> and then I worked for a while doing business analysis, consulting, I was a sysadmin. I went back to CMU, uh, studied economics this time, uh, finally got my degree after a while, and uh, I was accepted in grad school. I went to Northwestern for a bit, uh, started an econ PhD program, uh, spent about two years there, and uh, left again for reasons. <laughs> and then I worked uh, for Solutions for Progress in Philly, uh, first as a research assistant. Um, if you're interested, ask me sometime about the farm. And uh, after that, a software engineer, um, because the company needed someone in the systems group who could code Perl, and I could do so poorly, so uh, it was better than working on the farm. <laughs> and now I'm working for Comcast as a uh, DevOps engineer, or as I prefer calling it, DevOps. Um, so I want to begin with what economists can learn from programmers, or developers, or sysadmins, or what have you. Uh, first, sustainable development. Um, as I said before, modern econ is programming, statistical modeling. So much of it is part of empirical work. Um, empirical work is one of the, the standard things in uh, economics nowadays. Uh, computational econ is increasingly popular, um, and so this is basically simulating economic agents using uh, AI techniques. You might have heard of like agent-based modeling. Uh, general purpose graphics processing units, they're available, they're getting cheaper. Um, they make large-scale optimization problems faster and cheaper to solve because most of what economists do boils down to linear algebra. And GPUs are excellent at doing linear algebra really, really fast. Um, finally, algorithmic game theory. Um, it's of considerable interest uh, in both CS and economics, and there's a lot of overlap in that field. And you find this a lot in things like auctions, um, like eBay or uh, all pay auction sites. Um, you even find uh, algorithmic game theory in things like uh, load balancing and routing. Um, but it turns out that coding gets short shrift. Um, when, you're a, when you're a grad student, you're spending most of your time in classes. You don't really have actual time to do it right, you just have to get some results. Uh, there's no formal training. Um, you're thrown in, you get a problem set. Um, there's very little direction. Um, you wind up using a lot of code written by a handful of people with no documentation, 
but someone in a previous class or in another group told you, yeah, this is what you need to get it to run. Um, programming, data munging, debugging. Uh, if you're lucky, you can get a research assistant to do it, but of course, when you're that research assistant, eh, you got some problems, possibly. No time to learn Fortran. And there's a bunch of econ uh, code out there written in Fortran. But there's no time to rewrite it in Python either. Um, so what do you do? And if you're real unlucky, you might just get an executable and now uh, you've got this black box and of course there's no time to reverse engineer it. Um, so you work, work, work and a few years later, I don't remember making this, but it works. <laughs> well, I hope it works. You don't know. Um, however, there's hope. Um, there's something called the Quanticon project, which uh, has blossomed uh, since last year when I was uh, to give this talk. Um, it's basically open source Python and Julia libraries. There's a bunch of tests. Um, it's, uh, it's got backing from uh, various, research, uh, uh, various research groups. It's fantastic so far. Uh, the software carpentry, um, basically teaching uh, general skills of writing with modules, writing uh, sustainable code. Uh, FRED, which is the Fed Reserve Economic Data Website in Quandle, uh, that's a site with pay and uh, um, free and paid data sets. And these offer standardized APIs, so you have to do a little less munging than, than you previously had to. And the Open Knowledge Foundation, which has uh, all sorts of resources for people who uh, never had the data courses or, or the uh, data analysis courses, but uh, they're, uh, it's an easy way to uh, get started on that. Next thing to learn, algorithms. And you don't need to be an algorithms expert. You don't need your intro to algorithms book from, from undergrad if you've had it or whatnot, but it's kind of good to have a grasp on asymptotic behavior because data sets are often bigger than you expect, but they're usually smaller than you hope. Um, and you have to be careful about, uh, you've got an N squared, algorithm, you're running it on a huge data set, it could very well take a while. Uh, bonus, um, if you've taken uh, econometrics courses, you find that some of the ideas of statistical asymptotic behavior move over to algorithmic asymptotic behavior. Um, as an, uh, when I was doing undergrad research, one of the things that I found myself doing over and over and over was nesting loops sometimes three, four, five layers deep. Time to take a step back, because I'm probably duplicating things, I'm, I can probably, you know, think about some shortcuts to make uh, the, the calculations a little bit uh, faster. And finally, don't do more than you have to. Uh, use techniques to pre-compute things, uh, like memoization, dynamic programming, um, Finally, testing. You've got results, but are they consistent? I don't know. Did you make sure you have your controls? I think so. You made a complicated model. Are its implications what you thought they would be? Well, I wrote them on paper, but uh, I don't know. And finally, you're using your colleagues' libraries and their floating point, and your colleague doesn't really understand IEEE 754, so what you think you might be getting isn't necessarily what you're actually going to get. So how bad could it be? Well, here's a few disasters. One is Donahue and Levitt paper, the abortions and crime paper, basically showing trying to demonstrate that there was a link between abortions in the 70s and declining crime rate uh, 20 years later. It turns out that the code neglected to include the controls 
Um, so forgot to control for various things. And once you corrected that, the impact was just about zero. Uh, there was another paper from Marty Feldstein uh, claiming that Social Security depresses savings. Um, there was a, uh, an error in that that once uh, in the code that once fixed uh, reduced that to virtually zero. And finally, most recently, the Reinhardt and Rogoff paper uh, claiming that high debt levels reduce growth. Um, this is important in part because it has significant policy implications uh, for EU austerity, and in fact, it was a paper used to justify it. But it turned out that there were significant uh, Excel copy-paste errors, uh, which totally overstated the relationship. Whoops. So what can we do? We can uh, learn, uh, economists should learn to write tests. Unit tests for small model components, integration tests for full models, and uh, regression tests uh, to make sure that the regressions, as it were, you uh, developed uh, actually, uh, you know, the, the results don't uh, change dramatically if you change small features in your uh, code. Uh, use standard libraries. Uh, they're out there. Um, they work most of the time. Uh, there's usually documentation. Uh, explicit checklists for control variables. You think you've included all of them? You probably haven't. <laughs> Finally, use GitHub or GitLab or some collaborative system. Um, because you can get other people looking at your code, you can do code reviews, and finally, you get version control in the deal, which, when I was studying economics, most people didn't use it. Uh, now I want to turn to what programmers can learn from economists. Uh, first, causation. Uh, this says, lurking variable kitty, where you least expect it. So modeling in one slide. So in any sort of model, you've got factors X. You want to see how they, uh, what impact they have on some other variable Y. Uh, you build models to estimate those effects. Uh, one of the core assumptions is that X is uncorrelated with Y. Frequently it's not true. We hope it's true. When it doesn't happen, you have endogeneity bias. Uh, the most popular way to deal with that is replace that x with another variable that's correlated with x, but not with y, and that's called an instrument, then you rerun the regression. Um, and I want to use this to troubleshoot like an economist, but uh, one, there's endogeneity bias everywhere. It's more difficult to avoid in tech debugging uh, in part because instruments are terribly difficult to find. Uh, you can't really ignore uh, institutional effects. Uh, it turns out that seemingly technical causes are actually policy related. Uh, a problem, a programming problem I had at work a couple of weeks ago uh, was actually due to the code. Uh, the code I was dealing with was actually uh, correct, but I was attempting to uh, place, uh, um, but it apparently violated certain policy rules that went into developing the program. Um, and this was something that took me a long time to figure out because I was focused on the technology, but not the policy. And finally, in tech and economic modeling, it's important to understand the cultural and historical context. Economic models make all sorts of assumptions about culture and history. Doesn't necessarily look like it in a simple regression, but you know, we frequently assume that uh, countries have normal sort of you know, growth and spending patterns and any deviations are what we're looking for, and that's, you know, a sort of tacit, we, we tacitly assume some sort of normal. 
Um, and, and similarly in uh, programming, we, we make all sorts of assumptions even beyond internationalization and localization. Uh, the classic example being, uh, does someone have, uh, assuming that someone has both a first and last name. And of course there's many other uh, assumptions that we, we make and get broken at our peril. Um, next I want to talk about specialization in trade, which is something that I think uh, we can learn about. And it's a little contentious because I think generalists are awesome, but life's too short to do everything. Do you really want to write your own network stack for production? I don't. <laughs> Uh, even a skilled generalist can benefit from specializing, and novices can help with that too. And specializing is a lot less useful without trade. If there's no one, in, uh, if no one wants uh, your uh, COBOL expertise, there's a little benefit in focusing on it. And so we come to comparative advantage. This is David Ricardo, who first developed the idea in the late 18th century. Um, I want uh, first absolute advantage. Alice is better at writing network code than Barb, and Barb is better at building numerical models. Hence, they should just do what they do best. On the other hand, comparative advantage. Alice can do. Alice can write network code and numerical models better than Barb, but Alice is better at numerical models than she is at network code. Um, hence, Alice should take on the numerical models. Barb writes the network code, they can do, uh, they can both work at the same time, and so they can get more done than either alone. But this is a hasty generalization. Comparative advantage demonstrates what's possible, not necessarily what's best. Finally, I want to talk about what both economists and developers can learn uh, and have to learn. And one of them is, and really the main thing is community reflection and action. And this is where the communities are similar. Uh, this is the classic XKCD comic about fields arranged by purity. Um, economics wants to be somewhere around mathematicians. Um, it's, uh, in terms of practice, it's somewhere between sociologists and psychologists. Um, there's a premium on the hardcore. Both tech and econ spend a lot of time on hierarchies. You know, in tech, OS hackers are hardcore and real, web devs are not. In economics, the hierarchy is theorists are at the top, and then there's industrial organization people, and economic historians, uh, such as myself, are not. Um, and both have forums that advance these sorts of ideas. In tech, there's uh, Hacker News, and in Econ, there's Econ Job Market Rumors, which is basically the 4chan of economics. <laughs> Take that how you will. We are only as good as what we tolerate. We need to critically examine our fields. Uh, we need to look at this, these arbitrary classes of real programmers and real economists, reevaluating privileging theory over what actually happens. And in tech, we need to uh, reassess our privileging of tools over people. Um, and by people, I mean devs, end users, support. The minorities in both fields are underrepresented and discouraged. Um, I was the only, when I went to grad school, I was the only active uh, African-American in my department, uh, that's student, faculty, and I think staff. Uh, there was one professor who had retired a couple of years before, um, and so I felt very out of place, um, and I also felt largely out of place until relatively recently in tech. Um, and in both fields, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia are rampant. Um, I can talk about uh, things I've seen in econ offline. Um, but what can we do? One is more inclusive events, not just uh, across race, gender, and class, but also skills and interests. And perhaps there could be an econ equivalent of Bang Bang Con sometime. 
<laughs> uh, make it easier to get into technical and economic discourse. Uh, blogs and Twitter have made a significant shift in voices in econ over the past few years. And uh, be patient and listen. As Katzmal noted yesterday, uh, it's best to refrain from approaching a problem tools first, whether you're trying to impose an economic model on, on, your, uh, on, your, on, on your observations or uh, a, a programming language or libraries on a, a programming task. And finally, this talk is dedicated to my colleague, uh, Tiago Perez, who uh, passed away two weeks ago. We were classmates at Northwestern, um, and uh, his birthday was on uh, May 4th, so may the 4th always be with him. Thank you.